question. It gives me huge pleasure to introduce uh, Lisette de Silva Bull, who's going to explain a little bit about what we're going to achieve in this masterclass on Handel's flute and recorder sonatas. Lisette and I will take a little bit of um, uh, turns to to address some um, information, to, to give some information on Handel. Um, I, I'm not so good on the Handel recorder and flute sonatas uh, from the point of view of, of a wind player. I'm a cellist, um, but I'm certainly good on the background, the, the things that gave rise to these pieces and what Handel was doing. So we'll we'll exchange a bit of information between ourselves. And then uh, in about 10 minutes, we'll probably start with our first participant, Jessica, who will be playing uh, Handel's B-flat recorder sonata. I just see um, Francesco is asking which sonatas we'll address. It will be the B-flat major sonata and the sonata in D minor. So, Lisette, let me hand over to you. Well, thank you very much, Taddy. Well, this is a bit of a thrill, isn't it? Because Handel is um, the principal theme today, and we are all about Handel in the Brook Street Band. So we are kind of at home, and it's very exciting. It's also very exciting because we've got you, Tatty Theo, who's um, one of the foremost experts in Handel in the world. Um, and it's just such a great thrill to work with you and amazing that you're here. You're not just the moderator and a great, great friend, but you're also this amazing brain. So it's amazing to have you here. But you also have the gorgeous Nicola Lotton, whose research I've drawn. Um, Nicola is a lovely player and academic. And she did her PhD dissertation on the solo sonatas of George Friedrich Handel with particular reference to the sonatas for flute and recorder. And I have taken time and I have read the whole thing and it's been brilliant, Nicola. Thank you so much. And I know I will come back to it many, many times. Um, for players, um, this sonatas have always been a little bit murky in, in terms of origin and the prints and what's original and what isn't. Um, and the brilliant thing about Nicola's research is that she is a player and that comes across so beautifully. We need more of you, um, Nicola, <laughs> that play and research. Because um, you mention all the things that we as players really want. Um, to, to know which is um, who was around, what was happening in London, who possibly were the players, um, what instruments, and then the particularities about the sonatas. Um, and it's just a lovely one-stop shop. And I'm sure Nicola did her PhD, and this was, I think, she got it last year. So it's actually really brand new, and it's very exciting that between her and the amazing Tatty Theo, and in some other ways, me, <laughs> that, <laughs> with all that incredible information, I really wanted to flag this up. Go and read it. It's a fantastic read. It's a lot of fun. Really good information. Um, and actually, um, PhD dissertations can be fun. <laughs> Believe it or not, it takes an awful lot of work, and I should know. I never finished mine. <laughs> but um, it, it's brilliant. So thank you very much, Nicola, for your brilliant and hard work. So... Um, I think it might be really nice thing to give a little bit. Um, well, the, the dissertation is online, but I'm sure we can put a link, Martin, yep. um, Nigel, to it. Um, and do, I mean, uh, for those who know Nicola, please, you know, she is brilliant and lovely. And um, it will be really nice. I'm sure she would love to, to hear from you. So it will be really good. So we're playing two sonatas um, from the original sets of sonatas and um, there are 14 authentic sonatas that exist in Handel's, um, Handel's autograph and today we've got the B flat major and the D minor. Now those two recorder sonatas are from an earlier print. I'm not going to go in too much of the ins and outs and perhaps Tati will be able to um, help with that because I know a little bit but um, about it but suffice to say both the B flat major and D minor precede the flute sonatas and um, yes Tati. Go Sorry I'll just add in um, basically for those of you wanting to know the provenance of these pieces can I just sum up in, with a few words it's a mess basically, um, the, the history of the sonatas. There's so much confusion. 
amongst these pieces pretty much more so than any other pieces, certainly any other chamber pieces by Handel. And we'll come to the reasons for that in a little bit. But as Lisette says, these two are both Fitzwilliam sonatas and we have autographed manuscripts for both of them. So we're on very firm territory here. Some of the others not so. But later on, perhaps I'll come to, to what was going on in Handel's life and why there's such a mess around the kind of dating and the provenance of the sonatas. But no, just wanted to cut in with that. Just, just that's my summary. It's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. But Nicola is made light of it and it's it's just um brilliant and here jessica is your sonata in original print okay this is public domain and so as you can see they were printed with the top and the base part and i do i don't know if you can see it but there's a keyboard here and i will attempt to um as we talk through um the master class a little bit because obviously these are solo pieces um and uh but i think well lo i think lots of things and i'm sure you'll hear <laughs> um it but uh what's interesting in this setting is last time for instance with the hand with the telemann um fantasias or fantasias you know they are pieces that constructed to sound on their own without a bass and i actually think although these pieces have got a bass line um it is a really interesting thing to try and make sense of these. I mean, absolutely, you should have the baseline olive so you know what is underneath it all. But it's a wonderful thing to try and make the line stand by itself too. Now, you know, Handel was primarily an opera composer, and that's what his focus was. I mean, it is perhaps, do you think, Tati, fair to say that his, his best music was you know, his vocal, his oratorios, his operas. It's it's certainly vocal. That's what he's known and loved for. Um, but I, yeah, I think we've got to put oratorios up there as well as opera because... Yeah, yeah oratorio and opera. Yeah, definitely. because yeah. that was his main love, actually. Opera, he sort of turned to out of a need to survive financially. But oratorio, I feel, was where his heart lay, actually. Mm -hmm. I think the mixture of the, the, the use of text of... Um, you know, he came from a religious background, remember? He wasn't necessarily a strongly practicing religious man, but he did come from that background. But I I do find, as you say, the, the link with vocal music, it can be applied throughout any of his instrumental music. I mean, basically, he wrote a pretty good tune, and those <laughs> tunes can be sung. I mean, I always start off by practicing, actually, by singing my, my melodies, you know? It is a really good idea, and I think for us, we're, we're lucky as woodwind players because we've got breath. We've got the extent of the breath and in, in ways we are a voice that is closer to the human voice because we, we have to, to use breath to produce sound. I think that although, yes, he was oratorio composer and opera composer, but I think his instrumental music is a pure reflection of who he is as a composer. And I don't think the music lacks. I think perhaps to say it's simplified somewhat to suit instruments i'm not sure that's particularly fair but i think it really is up to us as performers to find the narrative and the storytelling within the music with all the devices um that we've got um to our disposal so if i um talk a little bit about um these pieces so they were uh, published in london uh, between 1730 and 1731 by John Walsh, who was his publisher. Um, I think this sonata is very much for the domestic market. They would, they're not the easiest pieces, some of them, so they would have been also be for proficient players. Now, around this time, the sort of earlier part of the 18th century, for recorder players, and certainly 17th century too, is a very exciting time because um, the recorder had set more of a center stage than the flute, um, believe it or not. It was not the same in other countries, but certainly in England, it's always been a really, really friendly place um, for recorder players. And so these, um, John Walsh was a really good businessman, so he knew what sell, what sold. Um, not only did he also publish sort of Corelli's Opus 5, um, and Jimmy Yen, all kinds of other composers were being printed and published and literally readily um, consumed by the recorder um, playing public. 
Now, there were quite a few professional players that were multi-instrumentalists working in, um, in Drury Lane. These are theatres in London, in West End, and Lincoln Fields, the Queen Theatre um, in London. And there was a fair amount of chamber music played before and after, you know, in intervals of plays, some of them had music. So, um, I think that, um, you know, it's possible, perhaps, that some of these, I mean, if you think of, the, you know, Sam Martini's recorded concerto in F, for instance, um, and other pieces, Baston concertos, I think they may have been also performed um, at Drury Lane, but there are some um, players that would be interesting to, to hear from, which is James Paisible, Paisible, who's a French man, who came to England, uh, John Bannister, Latour, Jean-Baptiste Noyer, who apparently um, is uh, supposed to have uh, really brought the, the Brock flute or made, made it, um, um, uh, you know, more fashionable in, um, in London. Um, and the recorder seemed quite a popular instrument and attractive um, to audiences. Um, San Martini arrives in 1729 and then you've got John uh, Festing and um, another one, I can't remember now, on the flute. And by late 1720s, flute players are coming through. But until then, we've got very much the recorder. Now, according to Nicola's research, hello, Nicola again. <laughs> um, and this is interesting. Uh, the new design for recorders and oboes arrives with French, um, by the way. And she gives the date in and, and, um, 1673. I know that the Bassano family had arrived previously and brought with them um, Renaissance in style instruments. And I think up until that point, this is something I didn't know, that up until that point, they were used that as late as that. So that is really interesting. So we've got Hotter family with French instruments and the Bresson um, family comes later as well. And if I remember correctly, I studied the Royal Academy of Music and I remember knowing that the Bresson workshop wasn't far off um, from where the Royal Academy is, um, between Baker Street and, Mar and Marylebone High Street, I think it was some there, something there, which is very exciting <laughs> for me as a recorder player. Then you've got, in England, you've got, um, as London recorder and flute makers, you've got Thomas Stainsby and, and Bresson as well. So there was a wealth of um, international players, really, that were feeding into all the theatres and no doubt were known to each other and published music as well for the recorder playing public, which is really lovely. Um, now, I actually have with me, um, and this might be interesting to some of you, um, a Stainsby recorder. This was, I think, one of my first handmade recorders. This is one of the last um, recorders that Frederick von Huna um, actually built himself. So I'm really, really, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's lasted a long while. Um, and English recorders, such as Handel, sonatas would have been played on, would have been, so why the ball? And I do remember when I got it when I was, you know, a teenager, um, listening, hearing about the English sound and how powerful these instruments could be on the lower register. I also have my trusty Denner treble recorder, and you can see a little bit of the difference in design. And especially when you come to the ball, which is wider, slightly wider on the Stainsby hence the more powerful notes and if you look uh, really at the register and the end uh, length of of these sonatas they don't go very high they tend to stay within the medium um, register and that's also to do with um, the quality of the instruments that handle new now when it comes to Actually, you said that's going to be a good thing in terms of our microphones. Um, just to reassure you, Georgia, I know you're sorting out your microphone at the moment, that actually if they're sitting in the lower register, that's that's beneficial for... for <laughs> Handel certainly did not intend these, uh, I can fairly, I can say with hand on heart, he didn't assume these sonatas would ever be heard over a computer. Thank goodness they can be. Thank, thanks to modern technology that we can all do this today. But that's Brilliant. Now, let me just, um, now we're going to hear, we, we're going to um, 
talk a little bit more about about things but last time and I, I I'm personally really keen on um, meanings and key meanings and and temperaments and, and things our instrument like I said last time in the in the Telemann masterclass hasn't really been altered in this particular form there have been you know the eagle recorder there's there's many um, wonderful makers now doing things to it that suits a more modern um, sort of repertoire that's now becoming available so it's a very exciting time to be a recorder player I think the most exciting time to be a recorder player so yay go recorder um, and Jessica we're about to hear you play the B flat major sonata and I thought I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on the meaning out of your beautiful sonata now Patty actually has the provenance um, of two of the movements of the B flat sonata I do, yes. Um, so the B-flat sonata, one of the Fitzwilliam ones that we're lucky enough to have Handel's autograph for, like most Handel, there are endless borrowings. Um, and so you get to hear, I, I think of this as a bonus, because you get to hear his music in lots of different incarnations. So um, we, we can date this piece accurately from the fact that some of the first movement appears in one of his operas from exactly the same time, Scipione, from around 1726. Um, some of the material, the musical material from the second movement is heard in an organ concerto, Opus 4, Number 4. Now this piece wasn't composed until much later. The organ concerto comes from 1735, or at least that was when it was published. So Handel obviously revisited the recorder sonata on the hunt for a good tune. Um, I may have mentioned already it's called reheating, by the way. <laughs> which is a nice word, I think, in association with Handel, because we know he liked his food. So, you know, he reheated, he was known as a musical reheater. It wasn't just him, by the way, it was most 18th century composers. Um, and the third movement of your sonata, Jessica, I'm not sure how much you're planning to play today, but anyway, the third movement, um, you find it um, in the violin sonata, published in the same set, this Walsh Opus 1, that these sonatas are also from, Opus uh, Opus 1, number 3, and it's in A major at this point. And again, that sonata, and we know from the paper it's written on, is again dating from around 1725 to 26. I find it quite interesting that the pieces are earlier than any of the publications, really. Um, he wrote them, um, not necessarily with the view to doing anything with them at all. But we'll come to that later, um, as to why he might have sat on them for a few years and why he suddenly allowed them to be published later on and what that might have meant for his financial circumstances and his personal circumstances. But that's more than enough talking for me now. <laughs> it's, Should... it's really, really fantastic. I love this because I think there is, for all of us who love, this music you know there is a bit of the detective in us down to the type of paper printed Nicola yeah more research and Tati was telling me this as well um, it's just such a brilliant thing it does feel a little bit like detective work when you are really trying to piece together times so we've all come together here from all over the world because we love this stuff it's brilliant now Jessica um, your sonata is in three movements two of which are dances now the first one is the Allegro, is the Courant, it's a French dance in three, quite light, actually it's quite a tricky dance um, and it was supposed to have been the favourite dance of Louis XIV who was a fantastic dancer uh, and the third movement is a gigue and a gigue is, um, I read somewhere that actually they were not um, supposed to, to be danced actually but who knows if that this is true or not um, but I do know if they normally come at the end of suites and the suite is um, a group of, of dancers um, I thought I would let you know also the let's have a look the key meanings of no, I don't know what I've done with this Lisette I've got this actually have you found it because I've, I've got access to this oh yes I've got it yes yep. I've got it I just I was looking in the wrong place Right, okay. So Matheson, in 1713, Jessica, writes that B-flat major is very diverting and sumptuous. What a beautiful word. <laughs> Don't you like sumptuous in relationship to music? Oh, and luscious would be another one. Um, yet it is somewhat modest and thus can pass as both magnificent and dainty. And Rameau in 1722 says it's of tempests and furies 
not sure so much on this one, perhaps on um, Georgia Sonata, the third movement of the D minor, it's more of Tempest and Furies than your gorgeous, lovely dance. You've got a bit of a dance track there with the B flat major, so we would love to hear it. Thank you. Okay. Am, I, am I playing all three movements? It's whatever you would like, Jessica, okay. however you're comfortable. Okay. Just, I want to... Check a couple yeah, just, of things. Just take your time. Play a little bit if you need to. Just checking to see if it's still warm, you know. Oh, yes, I know. Okay. Okay. listen to well, I know it must be terrifying <laughs> I mean, oh, Only lots. oh my goodness me and you know what we're all in this together all we want is to share the love of the music of this great man and to be there in support of all of you and all of us I love the idea that this is a brilliant forum now um, I think most of you don't know that Jessica is actually a professional player she's a professional flautist with a doctorate in music um, and she's all the way from, is that New York? I live uh, 20 minutes outside of New York City. Oh, so yeah, kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 
Um, and she's never had formal lessons. I mean, she's a recording artist as well in Latin um, music and jazz, which is amazing. What a gift. But you've never had formal lessons on the recorder. And I am no, never. so impressed. But I played for a very long time. My 50th anniversary is next month, yeah, but no amazing. lessons. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> Yeah, I was little when I started. This is not, yeah, but the thing is, this is the brilliant thing. This is not about age. Yeah. It's about love. <laughs> and love has no age. <laughs> and this is what this is. It's love handle and it's love, you know, exactly. And I'm just so thrilled um, that you're here. Um, and Georgia as well. This is such a brilliant thing um, to do. So don't, I don't want you worrying for a minute. I think we're all in awe of you and your courage and your lovely playing. So don't you worry about that at all. Now, what I'd like to talk about, obviously, things like breath control. You know this, you are, you know, flute player. Go when you're nervous. <laughs> that, that's the first thing. So I can talk about, you know, breathing lower and support, but you, when you're nervous, you know, you know all of this, which is fine. Um, I can talk to you a little bit. I'd like to um, talk about dance, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a dancer at all. I have had... Um, the privilege of learning with a French Brock dancer in as a recorder play in Lisbon um, and I've been playing for dancers since I was 15 years old and I've been part of many many productions directed music for dancers um, really all my life so I know a little bit I'm not a great dancer and I don't know it all in any way shape or form but I, what I do know is how much it informs the music already your music has so much liveliness and I can feel the Latin <laughs> the Latin is fantastic it's so lovely um, and quite right too um, one thing that a lot of you or maybe some of you know or a lot of you know is that um, the first beat is incredibly important in um, and in well in any um, of the downbeat and it's curious that we call it downbeat because in dance it's actually there's no such thing as an as a down step as a first beat in dance, and I don't know if I can do this um, in my little music room. And I am outside Canterbury in England, <laughs> in the middle of the countryside, <laughs> and I don't know if you'll be able to see um, what I'd like to to do now. This is a courant. Um, and it's a dance in three. There is no way, uh, and there, there's a very, very basic step that everyone can try. You know, this is um, not as cool as the salsa, <laughs> which is also in three, Jessica. But this is, well, we can imagine almost like this is the sort of Baroque salsa. I don't know if I'm going to be shut down for this, but in any case, the important thing to know is that there are two very important um, things when it comes to the first beat. The, the first beat is up and the preparation as well. So that you've got a preparation is a bend. Okay, I'm not going to go into all the details of yeah. um, second or third position because it's more or less where we start. But that you've got and one. So you go on your tiptoe. You see? ta ta you see it's always up it's incredibly light and this is so important for any dancing at all because you'd never do and one this doesn't exist at all you see at least not in northern europe yes absolutely yeah. not in northern europe southern europe it's whole different it's yeah. all that all i know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic i love it uh, but in um in this time these are, these are French dancers, um, and clearly there's a huge amount of Italian and French influence in, um, in England. It's, um, London in particular was always a, a melting pot, um, and so these dancers would have been known um, from the time way back from John Playford and the dancing master all through up to the 19th century and um, all kinds of really fun dances. But the important thing um, to know is that the first step is always up. And for those who are at home who want to give it a go, I don't know if you can see me. Yeah, we can see you. Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Um, so the first two beats, I in, in this kind of um, movement, I always like to think of words and text to go with it. And I always think of 
Hello, and here we go. Hello, and here we go. Hello, da ti da dum, two, three, one, two, three, one. You've got a line as well that doesn't necessarily, this is one in a bar, but the structure of it is probably um, closer to four bars each. But the important thing to know is that you prepare the first beat always by playing. So there's a cushion and one, two, three, one, two, three, one. The arms would do wonderful things as well. Um, but I'm not expert. I know a little bit enough to know things like that, which really helped me as a player, actually. Really, really important. Uh, that, that was fascinating to see that, Lizette. It comes across well on screen. Um, um, oh, I'll, I'll come to you in a second, Georgia, with your question. But just to say also, you, you mentioned, Lizette, that we're not hearing, of course, the bass line. And of course, if we had the bass line in front of us as a bass line player, you would see that the, the structure of that and the chords are all weighted to help um, highlight the architecture of the piece. Absolutely. So you've got... but, but I, actually, that's a really good... Um, I'm going to give you a little bit, perhaps. <laughs> because what I'd like you to think of, Jessica, when you play, is the image of all this lovely dancing and lightness Okay, which is fantastic. And then we can play. You know, last time we were talking about jazz and about the back of the beat, the front of the beat, the side <laughs> of the beat. And the middle. <laughs> and the middle as well. Right down the middle, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. all of this is, is really interesting because within those steps, within that musicality, you can do things. And this, you can really make it dance. And I can hear it in you playing that you've got this wonderful ability because this is, you know, this is in your soul. And I can hear it, <laughs> which is Just lovely. Nervous, yeah. Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah. It's not because it's all right. It's because you care, <laughs> and I'm just really thrilled you're here. So thank you. So this is not a harpsichord. This is your just your box standard home instrument. So I hope I can make it justice. So the upbeat of this sonata, you don't have it on the bass, but you've got hello. <laughs> phrase on to bar eight mm -hmm. and what you did very well was a hemiola mm -hmm. so thank you for doing that and i don't know if you're aware of what a hemiola is and i'm sure you perhaps are yes you are yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> I heard it i got that like, yeah 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 it's yeah. really really fantastic so if i um play i mean you can, I think, um, add some slurs, but I, at this point, I perhaps wouldn't. I perhaps wouldn't. I would do it all with the articulation. The original print doesn't have any slurs. And I think it's really interesting. We are gifted on the recorder with these marvelous arrays of possibilities for articulation. Um, and I think together with the lightness, if you ta dum ta di da 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 di da 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 dum ta di and that's one phrase and then you've got a different idea um, even harmonically because things shift and what I did that a little bit of sneakily was this thing called inegal yeah, my, I was talking about with that my with my teacher. We were talk, talking a little bit about syncopation. I told him that I actually kind of wasn't really thinking of Inegal and sort of, I know we glossed over it, but I did hear that you put in like not a lot, just yeah. like just a little. I yeah. think, Taffy, what do you think? Do you think um, it's the program? Because <laughs> I think, I feel it is a little bit. I, I think it, I think it is. I think it depends what instrument you play it on. Um, I play this on the cello and I play it in a completely different key and it has a very different feel. So and in the, I feel it in a very different character and I think that's where the key comes into it as well, the key and the character. But I think also because you're communicating with your breath, actually, it's a natural expression. It's just got this slightly relaxed, rocking feeling. I, I, I like a little bit of it. And I think... Well, I have a question about that. May I ask a question? So, you know, I always sort of struggle with this question, like, when should we do Inegal? And I don't have a overarching, like... 
concept. I think that I strongly associate it with French music, but I, I don't know if I have any foundation for oh, that. Oh, you do. You, yeah, you, yeah. You, uh, yeah, you absolutely do. And I think, um, I mean, I would suggest a little bit of Inigal here because it's a French dance, for instance. You've got the French blades, you've got the French influence with the instrument. I think bring it on. For those who don't know what Inigal is, Inigal is French articulation, so notes that move by step. Now there is um, a bit of you know you've got to do it when you can when you move by step and when it's audible. So in fast passages it wouldn't be uh, perhaps um, advised to. Okay. Can you demonstrate it, Lizette? Can you play? And by the way, the vote coming through from the attendees overwhelmingly. I'm I'm monitoring. It's almost a bit of a quiz going on here. <laughs> okay, Al, because we play the first four bars completely straight and then swung, just so that we can hear a very obvious difference. I'm loving this, bring it on, come on audience, you know, <laughs> you know your stuff, this is fantastic. Okay, so let me just explain that Inigal is the displacing of the strong, um, the, the weak articulation onto the strong beat. So in, normally, it, if you've got repeated notes, so in this case, we've got a series of six that move exactly swing but not quite as swung as the swing because there's different degrees of this so some people believe there's different comes... degrees of swing absolutely yeah. yeah um so some people believe it comes from the viola da gamba bowing okay so the, the way it kind of lends itself and i have this love of um well cello and <laughs> viola da gamba and it just lends itself so beautifully some people think it's uh, woodwind articulation for you, actually, if even if you're not a woodwind player, you can do this. Um, you've got, if you think of the word teddy, 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 that will be the easiest thing to do. So you've got one, two, three. Teddy, 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 teddy. That is not swung, that is not inigal. Inigal is when you put the da where the ta should be, so you get ta ta da ta da ta da ta da ta da. So then, this is why it it lends itself to different degrees. Some people like it a lot. Some people do it everywhere, and some people moderate it. And I think it perhaps um, a good thing to to look at where it's appropriate to do more and less. Um, it's contextual. So if I do it completely straight. I like that. <laughs> And so I think what I think um, as well is that you can add texture uh, by varying your articulation. And I think that's really, really lovely. So if you think that you've got thirds without any gal, you can do in twos. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta can add something really interesting to the phrase and I think whatever you do that has this lift on the first is a good thing mm -hmm. really really good thing um it, I think the speed is fine and then I think things for instance like the articulation um and I would look at trills for instance um and Sometimes it's good to have an open trill, and I use it sometimes, but also... Uh, can I ask about that? So, oh, there, so um, I have a few options for trill fingerings, and um, there was sort of a raging war online about using this fingering, to which is the one that I was raised with, and definitely 
my teacher would rather go with the standard fingering for E and have sort of a sharp trill because he talked about how the Baroque people like their trills to be very wide. So I've been using this for this, even though left to my own devices, I would have used this. So it's, it's, it is a very interesting one because hot at air gives this one. And this okay. one is perhaps, I, I've got mixed feelings about it. I think you can use both. I prefer my trills to be in tune. You know what, me too, That's thank you. That's the basic foundation. And this is how I was taught, actually. Yeah. In tune. Then you can use a little bit of color. You can use the trill for color, for texture, for a little bit of bite. That's fine. But if it's too wide, I'm not sure the 18th century people like it, liked it too wide. I think there was even discussion then. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, actually, that being known, like, I could have done all of these trills in the entire piece with different with different fingerings because I feel like the choices are either veiled but in tune or pure but not in tune yeah. and my teacher would go for the pure but not in tune and I always prefer I like things to be in tune you know I think there is I think there is this is such a big subject oh my goodness <laughs> people <laughs> will fight recorders, oh yes anyway and flutes as well because we've got such pure instruments mm -hmm. um, and I think rather than one being against the other i think you can use them all but gotcha. in different in different ways i mm -hmm. think when it comes to i like that one i would do that this to me is not um it's not very nice yeah no i um, hate it i hate it i, I like think, this one but, but, it's perfect to me brilliant thank you and you can do both and i think right. rather than i'm not on Either camp, I'd, write, I'd rather play in tune as in mm -hmm. general, and that can be a challenge in these instruments, a bit, a bit beautiful challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but I would use them in different ways and different points. Gotcha. I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm not extreme when it comes to this. What I would say is perhaps I'd like to hear the appoggiaturas of trill a little longer. Okay. Sure. I think it on the beat, for instance, um, if we look at the very last um, two bars of the first movement. And I think sometimes it's so easy to play and not even notice where we're positioning the appoggiatura. It can very often come after the beat. Um, mm -hmm. So I think um, the appoggiatura is really, really important because the appoggiatura is the dissonance. And it's a really nice way of getting color and dissonance in um, a music that doesn't really um, like dissonance in strong beats perhaps but where dissonance appears is, is really interesting definitely um, but I think perhaps and there's an implication with the slur that, that the slur over twos um, there's a, a sense of it being like a little diminuendo mm -hmm. so that if you don't do the appoggiatura on the head of the beat and a little bit longer you're going to lose the effect gotcha. mm -hmm. do you see what i mean yes so, i do so rather <laughs> it conveys it an elegance as well and a lift and i mean the ornaments i've got a whole section written about ornamenting <laughs> And it's such a big, big thing, and it's mm -hmm. a really interesting thing, and I think it's another subject that really can po polarize people. And I think, really, it's it's all good. It's all on context, really. Now, I've talked quite a bit, and I am very good at talking a lot, <laughs> uh, but I'd quite like to hear you play that again. Or the first moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, perhaps just the first, the A section. And actually, before I play, can I ask one more question? Most certainly. So being nervous, what I found the most, happening the most was that um, I would have more air in my lungs than necessary and not sure how to, you know, as I'm playing modern flute, we, we move a very large volume of air. And so we're taught and we train to take in as much air as possible at all times. And that's not a good idea for recording. No. You find yourself kind of like with this feeling of like, and nowhere to put that air that you should not have taken in yes. oh the amount of times i did that and it, the air would come out through my nose as i was playing 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's only Sam Shazanova was they can sympathize. Yeah, yeah, it's um, absolutely. We all in this together. Yeah. I don't think yeah. there's one person, and if they are, they're lying because, yeah. quite frankly, <laughs> this right, is right. not easy for anyone. Um, yeah. but I think the important thing is two things mm -hmm. one is to really, when you breathe in, just try and get it as low as possible. Mm -hmm. Is that um, image? I don't know if, if you have time there is I, I did do a little segment on breathing and connection and mm -hmm. and relaxation and just preparing for, for, for playing or just to, to cool down after um, a day um, and I it's on our YouTube channel mm -hmm. one of the okay. earlier ones and I've done a whole section on breathing and centering sound I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and find links to put up for these as Lizette's, uh, as you're playing again, Jessica, and Lizette's mm -hmm. explaining, because yeah. they're really, really good resources. Yeah, they are. And it, I, I really I, I really believe in this very much. I've got asthma, and um, mm -hmm. it's really helped me control all kinds of breath. And allowed... So did Arnold Jacobs, you know, who wrote, yeah. who learned a lot about physiology and yeah. wrote about breathing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I really believe in um, two things when it comes to this. One is Alexander Technique. And um, breathing control, a really good breath control, and really a good technique begins with before you even pick up an instrument. Mm -hmm. It's how you mm -hmm. hold yourself, how you are inside your own body and your own mind. And if mm -hmm. you every, it's just about bringing everything down. And when you are stressed on a situation mm -hmm. like this, where you know you're live, you're playing, and you don't know me, but we're all friends now. We we all good. Um, mm -hmm. It's really learning to connect to your the center of your sound. If I stand up. And I don't know again. Um, it's just this idea of having these two, whether you're sitting down, that, that can work too. But this idea of having two, um, imagine you have two pieces of string, one pulling you up and one towards the earth. So you've got to, you're, like your feet are rooted, they're creating roots. Okay, and it's just a wonderful feeling because it brings everything down when you're breathing you and and playing as you know you use every single part of your body as a resonance box to your instrument so posture is really important so keeping everything open as singers using um the, you know, all the cavities here everything and just being aware of your body relaxed yet aware mm -hmm. you know so you've got your feet onto the ground rooted and your head towards the sky and imagining that you've got each shoulder towards the opposing wall being tugged very gently because what that should do is create a sense of space here because what you do the moment you get tense is this and we all do and your breath goes up so when you breathe i like to think of images for instance um, if you're pouring a glass of water you've got a jug of water into a glass of water Imagine that your breath is like the water and where it hits first is the bottom of the jug. And it should go down. And if you start by being aware of your posture, that should really go down all the way. So that by the time you come to pick up your instrument, you are open, aware, and you are a good vehicle for your sound production. Also, um, relax your pelvis. We tend to hold a lot when you when we walk. You know, there's wonderful exercises from Alexander Technique and other uh, Feldenkrais is as, as well. Really, really important, very good. Anything that allows you to be aware of your body and working with the natural movement of your body. So when you pick up your recorder, the recorder comes to you. You don't go to your recorder. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with a flute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same. It's the same. But also crucially, because we are wind players, I like thinking. Although I'm not a singer, but as a singer would. Do you see what I mean? And it's mm -hmm. just having all this openness. So when you produce tone, and this is when this the, the second thing is about. So you breathe in, but you need to know how much you need. That's it. Because our instinct, you've been so well trained, Jessica, as a professional player, on the flu, to just take it. I need lots, and, yeah. Absolutely. And you need to open up. Because when you breathe, really, for all those who play woodwind instruments, you are using the whole range all the way through your um, rib cage at the back, 
Um, it, like I said, the, the All that musculature, yeah. Apps, everything yeah. goes. And you don't just obviously breathe into here because you've got all the chest cavities as well. All of this is mm -hmm. important. All of it is important, but all of this must be open. Um, and there's two things. So you breathe what you think, you need to practice this, what you think is correct for the phrase. Because if you over breathe, if you breathe in too, too much, two things may happen. One is that you do this. And you hold. Mm -hmm. And then the, the air comes out of your nose. Mm -hmm. But we... Just really, really relax. Practice long notes, Jessica. Long mm -hmm. notes. The recorder is not your principal instrument. You're a fabulous musician and highly, highly trained. And there are some things with this that may mean that you're going to be working against what you've been taught mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> and I can see that there is yeah. um, a side to it but I really would go back to the breath to where your center is to connect mm -hmm. with yourself in any case to connect with how your body feels before you even pick up your instrument because mm -hmm. we are so heady you're a highly intelligent woman and it, one sometimes we can be so heady in our heads that we forget to connect to our bodies mm -hmm. and music is all about connection it's all about connection. I like to think of a circular, we have to, to, to stop very soon, but I like to think of a circular motion with the breath. That It's like a mm -hmm. circle, I like it perpetual motion. In two ways, one breath is just there occurring naturally, also that the music is already there, mm -hmm. that we pick it up, we have vehicles for it. And I, I really um, love that. Um, <laughs> and so, whatever it is that we can this is why music is such a beautiful solace and beautiful comfort especially at times like this and i cannot tell you how moved i am that we are all able to be in this forum this afternoon or this morning <laughs> connecting yet again through it and i think it's fantastic jessica we're going to have to move on now that's but okay that's great have any, any questions do write to me i will thank you so much this has been very enlightening you know, it's been a real pleasure, and I am so thankful that you're here. Thank you very, very much, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, fantastic. Okay, now we're going to move on to our gorgeous Georgia. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Georgia. Hi. Should I try and plug this microphone in? This is... Oh, yes, is... we're having a few... <laughs> Um, can I just say, if you haven't plugged it in yet, your computer probably won't recognize the software. I wouldn't. I, I th That's going to require a bit of setup. I think let's just start and play, actually, and see what yep. we can hear. Brilliant. Okay, Georgia, let me just okay. tell you a bit about, um, about um, a few things I think might be whilst you're getting ready and prepared. I mean, I have to say, I know Georgia very well. She's a long, long standing friend. She's one of my best friends in the whole world. Um, and a wonderful uh, player, and I'm really thrilled you're here, <laughs> all the way from London. <laughs> so you're not as far. As <laughs> <laughs> uh, not as far as New York. Now the sonata in seven um, in D minor is H W V three six seven A, and this is a very particular reason why I'm saying this. Now this sonata seven movement, uh, but it is thought that the last two uh, don't belong. The, the, the sonata is too long and actually the first five movements have a natural conclusion um, and there is a version of this in B minor for the flutes but in this instance the D minor recorder sonata comes first yay for the recorder <laughs> in this instance I mean I play both but yes Tati no, it's just interesting you saying about the seven movement form because um, it's the only one with so many movements. Yeah. And I think they were added on probably for sailability because um, d to finish with a pair of dances, which which is what the sixth and seventh movements are, was just the ultimate English fashion at the time. And this is an era when, when money is being made from these publications. So I think that's probably why. They're definitely by handle. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant, that's fantastic. And the thing is, um, again, I think I, I'd like to go back to London and as a melting pot and a very vibrant place. It's always been, it's always been an international place, a place where all nations meet, creeds and faiths and, and all the more richer for it. 
Well, that, that's what brought Handel to London in the first place. Now, that's why he chose to settle here. I'm saying here because I'm lucky enough to be sat in, well, a little bit too far from Brook Street for my liking at the moment. <laughs> I'm in North London rather than Central London. But yeah, he was attracted to the fact that you could be free to be who you wanted to be. You weren't tied into um, being a particular religion. London was just so tolerant. Uh, and that, you know, he could really be a self-made man in those times. And I think this is where these pieces all stem from, actually. This wonderful flowering of instruments instrumental music just written you know he wasn't necessarily writing them for a particular person they're just there uh, as Lisette said maybe played in the intervals of pieces uh, larger scale pieces in the theatres but I, I just find it fascinating um, he must have come across some amazing musicians at the time and perhaps had them in mind when he composed these particular pieces um, and this, isn't that wonderful that he had at his disposal all these amazing, some of which I've already mentioned, but there's so, so many, many more. Um, and I'd like to, to do a couple of things. One, I'm going to talk about um, the key because I, I quite like, um, as Georgia knows, all of this has just been listening to me whittering on about this stuff for years. But it, it's really, really lovely. I think I'm going to talk two things, um, the key meaning of D minor and also symbolism and character. Um, for recording the flute. I mean, I know that from my own research into French uh, Baroque, this is something that's been very much on my um, forethought. So um, when I saw this in Nicholas' PhD, I was really, really, um, really happy and, and overjoyed. Um, and I think that's very much a player's thing. I think if you're a player, you really want to know the meaning of what you are doing and, and to have image and character. So thank you, Nicola, once more for your brilliant work. So the first thing I'm going to say is I'm going to give two quotes, um, one by Matheson in 1713, and I keep coming back to Matheson because he really was a really important theoreticist, um, German. But this is 1713, and D minor is somewhat devout, calm, also somewhat grand, pleasant and expressive of contentment. Therefore, it is capable of promoting devotion in church matters and peace of mind in common life. However, this does not prevent the successful use of this key for something amusing, not particularly skipping, but rather flowing in nature. <laughs> I like, I, I think it's beautiful. I think, um, I think we had this the last time, wasn't it, um, Tati, that a peace of mind in common life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'm just... Yeah, what an insight from Matheson. It's really interesting to see how contemporary musicians viewed these keys because it's very easy to imbue them with our own um, uh, ideas nowadays. And actually, we haven't mentioned, but we are dealing with pitch differences nowadays. So, uh, Jessica, I believe you were playing at 440. Um, actually, your music. No, that was a 415 oh, instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I, 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 it was the same as Lisette's, and I should have checked. In, uh, um, in advance. Sorry, I've got kids in the background playing music at 440 and it's all been music. <laughs> <laughs> ah! um, but, but of course, um, so, that, you know, D minor then doesn't actually quite sound the same now. It's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely not. And also, not only because of the pitch, but also what went into each scale, because the way the commas were divided between the notes was uh, made a huge difference to what key you played. So this idea when you sat to play a piece of music in the 18th century, you would have been um, aware of, of what it meant. And I think that added a level of understanding of the music. Now, Rameau says in 1722 that it is sweet and tender. Um, very short on words, but I believe Rameau was a little bit um, short. He was um, quite precise, quite a particular man. Um, now, there is the third, George is, we, we're talking about playing the first three movements. The third movement of the D minor sonata is, of course, um, in B flat major. And this is curious because um, it's not really, um, really related to, to D minor. It is a different key and it's named Furioso, Furious. And it's funny that in 1722, relating to B flat major, Ramo says it's about tempests and furies. I thought there was an interesting connection because he definitely does change it. Now, when it comes to um, symbolism and character of the recorder and flute, and this is a quote, Nicola, if I may, from your, P your lovely PhD. Handel used recorders to illustrate love, lyrics involving the heart, 
scenes of nature, the pastoral, the sea, death in nature and mythologically. He mentions, makes mention of wings or flights of birds or angels, um, but the later connected often in connection with death, sleep, the supernatural, heaven and birds. Recorders also have traditionally been used in pairs, not only to illustrate their association with love, but also to represent the alos, an ancient wind instrument, which um, side by side pipes. Now, if you think, for instance, uh, Bach's um, Actus Tragicus, um, cantata with two recorders, he very often uses it in twos as well. There's many, many examples of this. Um, the flute he doesn't, he doesn't tend to use them in pairs by the way, but the recording does do, which is really interesting. It might be to do with projection. There's lots of different ideas. I think when two recorders are in tune together, think of Brandenburg 4, for instance, the last movement, when you've got this wonderful section in, um, in, in unison, which is incredibly powerful and beautiful, the colour, my goodness. Now, um... Right, Handel continued this tradition almost always writing for paired recorders, even when they played a single melodic line. Now, Handel used the flute to illustrate many of the same subjects as the recorder, but also to, to portray sadness. And he used the instruments for arias on the subjects of grief, bereavement, parting and suffering. He generally scored the flute on its own rather than pairs. So um, there's a lot of food for thought, and I like words as being powerful tools of imagination. And um, they're not just empty. And I think all these wonderful descriptions, I, I quite like as a player to have an idea of a feeling, a connection, emotional connection and bond. Um, Georgia, it would be such a pleasure to hear your beautiful first movement of the D minor. Georgia, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. I think we're having a bit of trouble with the Wi-Fi. It's cutting off a little bit. But uh, what I heard, yes, Tati. It might be worth, Georgia, just stepping a little bit 
further away from the computer or the mic. Just for all you attendees, we have set up, we have checked all the settings are correct in Zoom for this and in George's computer, so we're not quite sure what's causing it to cut out. But I think if we try stepping a little bit further away, it was much better than in the, in the test run earlier. We could hear far more of you, which was great. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's it's a funny thing, but I know I heard um, enough to, to just I really really loved it. Absolutely, it's beautiful. Beautiful. You've you've got such lovely command um, of the instrument and lovely um, command of sound. And I think what I'd like to um, tune into this, um, it, it will be the vocal aspect of it, and talk a little bit about ornaments. Um, now Georgia knows me very well and knows my teaching very well. Um, so she knows <laughs> um, how I like um, thinking about this. Um, and one of the things we've been really talking about is um, finding the main melody. This is really quite, uh, it's lament-like, it's introspective um, in, in character, it's very heartfelt. I can absolutely hear the D minor sort of characterization of, of Matheson in it and I also can hear um, a vocal line very very clearly and I think when it comes to ornamenting um, it's a really I mean I will we'll talk if we have time a little bit more about it because I've got a few um, I ideas um, about this just from looking at it um, myself um, as part of, you know, I'm very honoured to be a, a me band member for the Brook Street. We do a lot of um, handle, and I always take very good care um, in making sure when I ornament or whenever we record that I do, to the best of my ability, something I I feel um, would be serving the music, um, not myself as a player to show off my amazing ability to ornament, <laughs> um, really. And I think that's really very important. He already gives you such beautiful clues in this instrument, in this movement, because he writes an ornament in the very first line and very first bar. It's already there because actually all you've got is a messa di voce on mm -hmm. one note. Really, that's what it is. And what is done, which comes, uh, brings us back to the function of ornaments, and what does that ornament does do to that particular note or bar as an opening statement to the whole sonata? Actually, it highlights the messa di voce. Um, and if you really look, and I'm sure a lot of, um, of you uh, listening in today will know this sonata. This is one of the, you know, these sonatas are very well known, very famous, quite rightly so. Um, but I really believe in simplifying before you start adding things up. Um, and really finding what the main line um, is, because if you really look at it, you've got a main note which is on its own. Um, the first bit without the ornament that handle wrote. <laughs> Others may even say that the whole of the first four bars is about these two notes. That's how he gets there that's interesting and that's how he writes the harmony in between but what you really have is the tonic and the dominant isn't it which is what um, something that is really important because what you did so beautifully Georgia is without accompaniment you managed to hold on to that C sharp in that four and I know obviously and you know what the bass line does to connect to the next um, bar which is a complete change in character you've got hope suddenly in f major which is a relative major of d minor but it was really lovely how you used the rests to get there and that's such a powerful thing and this is a really good example actually of a piece that kind of holds itself 
because the basis is implied and the basis all is the fundament and the foundation of it um, and you just played it so so beautifully now for those who um if i again go to my trusty <laughs> trusty um, modern keyboard you've got this wonderful um, walking bass descending line which in itself is meaningful as well over a single note um, if you go if you start looking at the symbolism of um, of patterns ascending descending and if you start looking at um, the meanings of those, whether they're chromatic or not, whether they're moving by step or jumping, they all have na names, by the way, and they're all meaningful. And I'm sure Handel, being German, um, was no stranger to this. This is very much in keeping with Music of the Spheres idea, by the way, and sim symbolism in all, um, in all of the, um, in all of this. So you've got this lovely bass line this is now in um, modern pitch by the way which is so beautiful and if you think of it without um the ornament if i put this i know it very well but just in case handle <laughs> melody isn't it tatty yeah it's you you could be sort of um plonked on a desert island having spent 20 years in outer space and not heard of anything anything <laughs> musical at all and you would know that as handle without a doubt um it's beautiful and so simple um I, there's actually just just but i'm sure georgia's will play again but very briefly there's a question from one of the audience members uh, about the use of dynamics to um emphasize the overall directions of the fourth bar how one would do that i appreciate it's difficult to perhaps hear on the computer because it did cut out a couple of times that that's the problem perhaps well, say, say that again so dynamics are incredibly important for direction is one of you know on the many many devices absolutely you can do um, and in this case if you know the sonata very well you know that on bar five you've got complete change of character so the heroine is no longer you know thinking oh this is you know this is my story this is my grief there's hope and it's really appropriate perhaps to have a much um louder start or restarts of 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 the melody um and in fact um, so if I try and play it a little bit, so this is from bar four, so you've got C sharp, so you've got the dominant. handle <laughs> and I would um, be very careful with doing too much to it when it, in terms of ornamentation um, and the reason for that being is what you have to to um, and this is not for Georgia this is in general and Georgia is beautifully being um, a guinea pig <laughs> thank you Georgia for your gorgeous playing and also for allowing us to kind of talk about all these really important things um, go to the purity of the text all is go back to bases all is go back to um where everything started from and everything starts from harmony it is what it is in harmonic rhythm and so the intention for the phrasing how he uses it and he really does know how to write a beautiful melody um, and i just wonder when it comes to ornamenting um i always have because i spent a long long time trying really hard to do as many notes <laughs> two things i spent as um as a younger player trying to play as fast to the beat <laughs> as i could 
and to add as many ornaments as I could. And as I got um, older and perhaps a little bit wiser, I started thinking, what am I doing this for? Who am I serving? Um, absolutely, less is more, without a doubt. And that used to drive me insane, by the way. <laughs> when I was a teenager, there is sort of a, a, my early 20s, you know, I just wanted to be flashy and, and, and fast and all of those things. No longer. I really, really love playing slow. And the older I get, the more I enjoy playing slow, but the harder it is. Actually, playing slow is far harder than uh, playing fast, really. Um, and it takes actually maturity to, to, to get that. Also, not only that, but that um, you don't copy, you find your own way. You listen, you absorb, and um, that you find your own ways with this from an informed place so that not too interpretations needs to be the same and I think that's the beauty and that's what, what we all as interpreters really bring to to the stage is our differences and we should really be reveling in them um, rather than being loggerheads at loggerheads sometimes now um, I think a, a really important thing to think is what is an ornament adding to the line is it rhythmic is it melodic are you ornamenting because you feel you should for its own sake? Are you doing it to show off technical prowess or to serve the music? And actually, how do we know what serves the music? <laughs> and I think to that, my only piece of advice and, um, um, you know, is that perhaps go back to basics see where the line actually is and I think what uh, Francesca had said very beautifully is that dynamically what can you do dynamically and when it comes to the recorder you know first of all you have to keep it in tune the command you have to have for this is most people don't understand quite how difficult it is to play it well and to do what Georgia did and to do what Jessica did is actually a feat isn't it that even to hold one line from beginning to end in perfect tuning and imperfect line with the right attack with the right ending already is in itself a thing and if you can do that to me you're good so then we we need to think what what do we want to do with the line what do we want to do that the ornament is going to add to rather than get in the way of and it is interesting at handles time you've got people like um like Babel, for instance, who heavily ornamented. There's um, Tati, you will know this better than me, uh, with um, Lasha Your Piano. Yeah, the Lasha variations. Uh, yeah, that's sort of how, that's the most amazing piece. If you look at it in the original uh, form, which I don't know if it's on IMSLP, but the, it's just the, 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 the geography of the piece, the, the sheer um, aesthetic look of it, it's like how many notes can he fit in in any given moment? It's absolutely crazy, actually. Um, Handel didn't kind of go for quite that much ornamentation. But. Well, this is it. The next thing, um, actually, first get down to the very basic and foundation. Get back to, to the bare bones. See where the phrase is going. The next thing, what would Handel do? Before you do your own thing, what would he do? What examples do you have? Now, as players, for instance, as flute players and recorder players, we've got, um, in, in terms of Telemann, a really wonderful set of uh, methodical sonatas that tell us very clearly how he would like to ornament. In the case of Bach, he is very precise. He writes all the ornaments himself. Mm. In, the case of tell, in the case of Handel, look at his vocal lines. Yeah. And George has actually put in the chat that, you know, if movements are repeated, you need to do something different. Baroque players will expect it to improvise. We can't actually hear that in this slow movement because it's written out. But, you know, if I don't know if we have time or what you what you both of you plan to do. But, you know, if we heard something with a repeating, then that would be a chance to to demonstrate that, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. And I think perhaps he he does it um, in some small measure. You can see what he does, for instance, on bar eight. This is the modern copy. We've got an ornament there. This is a really good example of what Handel uses. The first bar, but you can see how different they are. Um, 
We've got as examples, for instance, the Opus 5 Corelli, who were heavily ornamented, whose heavily ornamented first movements were apparently approved by Corelli. I'm not sure if he ever actually got to, to see them, but they, they were there, and they're very important to us as recorder players. Um, we've got, um, you've got Bassanti, you've got so many Italian um, examples. Um, and I'm not sure that is perhaps the best way to go with these sonatas, to be quite honest. I know that we as, um, as performers are repeatedly told or should be told that we need to emulate singers to the best of our ability. And this is where we need to go with our phrasing, with our um, dynamic range, with our, you know, all, all of those wonderful things, words, imagining words in, in the music. And we know that we need to emulate singers, but I don't think um, that we should, singers were told to be like instrumentalists in terms of ornamentation. So it's always the way, the other way around. So perhaps that is food for thought. And I don't think I have um, answers for this. I have questions. And I think the older I get, the more experienced I get, the more questions I have. Um, so perhaps more Germanic type, a bit more French as well. Um, there's a curious fact. Uh, George, I'd like you to play a little bit of um, the next movement about of the hornpipe. That would be really nice. But uh, Tati, you'll correct me if this is not correct. But when Handel um, went to Rome to, and wrote La Resurrezione, he met Corelli. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was playing in, in the band, was directing it. Yeah. And um, the story I, I read, not that <laughs> nobody told me because I wasn't there, <laughs> is that when... Um, Corelli picked up the music. He um, was a bit baffled about how to play it because he complained to Handel it was too French. Oh, okay. I, I'm not actually familiar with that interpretation of the story. I know the two men didn't necessarily get on and I know there was a bit of a problem with Handel setting uh writing perhaps his earliest violin sonata which is I guess sometimes played on the flute or recorder the G major one <laughs> which ends up ridiculously high and I personally think that that's him having a being a bit mean actually to Corelli saying here you go here's the sonata uh oops you can't actually get that high your technique but that's also partly to do with how you held the violin in those days Corelli would have held it lower down so uh, whereas nowadays it's slightly higher up and actually Handel favoured a higher up position. So um, you've got the problem of the, the um, where the neck joins the body, the instrument being in the way and actually making it hard to play high. So that's to do with different traditions and different countries and, and how you hold your instrument. But I don't know. I, I it wouldn't surprise me if Corelli said it was too French. I think there was probably a bit of um, rivalry. Yeah. Definitely. Well, that, what I read, and I can't remember, I can't name the source, um, but it was in a book, <laughs> a good book about Handel, and um, I can't remember which one, and this was a few years back, that apparently Handel took the violin from Corell and said, this is how you do it. Uh, I'll research that. <laughs> There's a whole handle shelf. I shall have a little look through for that story. But um, if yeah. If anyone would know this, Tatty Theo, that would be you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> Just think, just mindful of the time now. I think yes. we probably... Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, Georgia, do you want to do the second or the third movement? Well, I'll have a go at the second one. Yeah, go for it.
right, that's it. I'm unmuted now. <laughs> I forgot I was muted. I'm static. Um, thank you very much for that, George. That was lovely. Um, it's it's hard because there's a, a bit of cut off, but I I heard um enough, which is um really really brilliant. Okay, so we're going to talk about rhythmic impulse and about dance because hornpipe is a dance, but curiously, um. It's English and Irish in its origin, um, and it's been commonly associated with sailors, but that wasn't true um, in England until after the 1740s. So certainly at this time, the, the sonatas were, um, were written. It wouldn't have had the sort of sailor and the sort of seafaring um, uh, connotation, but you can see why. And it's kind of got rowdy and it's fun, uh, really fun, lots and lots of... Um, counter a sort of off the beat and um jessica for uh, for your um wonderful jazz playing that you do on your flute this um and latin music this would be absolutely perfect <laughs> to have that kind of you know lively um um boisterousness now again the thing with the first beat is that is up um and i'm going to go back to my stainsby this is the closest we're going to get to what uh, it is a very funky movement absolutely isn't that it? it just rock it well the rock and roll perhaps mm -hmm. i don't know it's a boogie yeah <laughs> um that you've got to anyway this is the closest with the stains to the to the sound um i'm not sure about the pitch um it would have been 415 uh, but that's it but that's a different thing perhaps lower actually um so it's the idea of bouncing off the first beat so you're already starting on the up but I've made you do enough one, two, threes. <laughs> Georgia, you know this very well. It's so beautifully rhythmical and energetic, and it's got this lovely um, little impulses. And again, I will attempt um, to play my um, modern keyboards, but it is so wonderful. And one day, um, I would love to think we all meet again in a room without masks, with harpsichords. I'm going to cry if I keep talking like that a little because I miss it so much. But uh, and that we can all dance and rejoice and play this together. In the meantime, I've got my um, dodgy keyboard at Modern Pitch <laughs> and my uh, questionable keyboard skills, but here you have it. So we've got this lovely um, upward moving phrase and the first bar that goes on to the second beat. so forth and it's really um lovely to play together but what i want you to do and this again it's really important to whoever is studying this um and doesn't have the privilege um of um, a keyboard um, living in the same house <laughs> keyboard player to play them is to feel the beat is something very physical it's something that comes from within it's not exterior it's from within and i think this is where the jazziness um really comes into it that you've got to have such a centered sense of pulse but in the lightest possible way yum and he's got this lovely um lovely ebb and flow all the time you've got this for it's like the waves even though this is not um at this point yet associated with seafaring and sailors but you can see why <laughs> And it's really lovely. And whatever you do with your articulation mustn't in any way disturb this really finely balanced um, sort of rhythmic idea, this rhythmic pulse. And I really like, you know me very well, Georgie, you, you know I'm always talking about circle when it comes to three. So one, that you've got 
everything comes from the first. And when you dance, that what I perhaps didn't make clear earlier when I exemplifies the Pas de Bourrée, which is the name of this very simple three step, is that there is hierarchy within the bar of three when you dance, that you start from a, so from a bounce, so that impulses you forward, that's the first thing, so you've got one still up on the two, and the third is going to the up to the one again. So you've got the first being very important because it's the first one, but never as a downbeat, always, always as a first beat with an upward movement. The second beat being the least important, and the third beat being more important than the second because it brings you back to the first. And that is there all the way through. One, two, three, one, two, three. And by the way, you never go onto your heels when you do this. You always start, um, I don't think you can see me. I really don't want to make it a service to all the beautiful Baroque dancers out there in the world, because I think you're all marvellous. But um, <laughs> this is just a very clumsy attempt. And one, two, three, one. And so you, you never fall down. So never, nothing is ever heavy. Everything is always up and light. Mm. There is wonderful painting if you ever get to see the Wallace collection. There's a wonderful painting and I, I think it's La Salle dancing and she's on tiptoe doing this. Well, La Salle was a big, uh, Handel had a big connection actually. He, in fact, any of the dance music that he did write, the limited amount that he actually wrote intended for dance, other than these wonderful pieces, which are full of dance rhythms, was for her actually, Marie Salle. Yeah, she was very, very famous for being a virtuoso. Mm -hmm. And there were two main dancers um, at the time, one for uh, knowing for being very virtuosic and the other one for being very sensual. And I can't remember which one was the ones that danced the Saraband without a corset. It was Marie Sally. Marie Sally was famous for dancing basically without a bra or corsetry. Yeah, just to be very free. Louche. But yeah. also very free. I, I, <laughs> Girl power. <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> Very on 18th century, but yes. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, so you can ever get to the Wallace collection. There's some wonderful paintings there um, of this. And the colours I love, all the colours of the trees and the flowers. And there's something so incredibly light. And that's how I hear this, that first beat is always up. There is no such thing as a downbeat. And I think perhaps that's a disservice that we've done from the string player. And not because there is any um, fault of the string players or violinists, the idea of down. Because actually, when you dance, everything is up. And that's a really important thing. So that when you've got anything off the beat, you've got to be so deeply rooted into that one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Can you hear anything jazzier than that? <laughs> Isn't it marvellous? Isn't it absolutely good? And you can vary this. You see, you can vary the degrees, but with all is within two. And so therefore, the more important in this particular movement is when you don't um, have um, things that go off the beats and when the bass line joins the top part. Um, for instance, bar 16, for those who are following with, with the score, um, this is the first half at the bar 16. When it joins, but there's so much wonderful um, off the beat. Georgia, do you want to give it a go? Oh. Um, Lizette, we'll no. both mute up again now. Oh, yes, 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 lovely. Thank you, Georgia.
Good. That's brilliant. Really, really brilliant. That's really. I think your Zoom is making some bits go a bit faster, but I, I know I can hear. Oh no, no, no! It's really, really lovely. Really lovely. Now, going is going from the first um, to the second bar is a funny one. If you don't put the trill, because there's a trill indicator on the third um, note, by the way. But if you take away the trill. Uh, And so what we need to think is what is the trill doing? And here, Jessica, for instance, I'm going to use this as a really good example. You actually can use either. This, this is a trill on the E, so that means the upper note is the F. And on the record, treble recorder, you can either do the trill like this or like this. So what do you want the trill to mean? Because the length of the third note is so incredibly important, how it links to the second bar. Do you see what I mean? Try it without. You're being my brilliant guinea pig. Thank you, George. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. So clear. So beautifully clear. Now, what I'd like you to do is when you add the trill, try a few things. But don't lose that lightness and that connection to the next bar. Brilliant. Okay. So did you see what that, that did? That shortened the notes too much, didn't it? Just, just give yourself... No, no, no. This is brilliant because you're helping a huge amount of people. Yum. Bum. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, bum, 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 and then it's like bum, 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 yuck, bum. <laughs> the tension and release. Brilliant. <laughs> That's it. Brilliant. Really lovely. Thank you, Georgia. What I would say is to keep that one in a bar, okay, but with the overarching of where the line is going. Where do you want it to go? I think it goes every two bars, or even every four, but certainly every two bars with ebb and flow. And so it's a really slow pulse underneath. Do you know, my teacher, many, many years ago, used to talk to me about um <laughs> there was a time i played an awful lot of vivaldi concertos very very fast and he said i was very good at playing a vivaldi concertos and i thought that was a really um a compliment <laughs> what he really meant is that i was had yet not yet to play properly slow <laughs> and this thing about slow pulse in fast movements and i, I remember thinking what is that? It's fast, what do you mean? Actually, this is exactly it. Mm. It's a really slow. It's actually underneath. But with everything in between on top, all the spice, all the cross rhythms that you have to have on top of this slow beat. So if you connect to that slow beat, Da, 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 and enjoy it. Have a lovely time. Go for it. I'm, I'm going to let you play now. Play the whole thing and see if you can get into well, as much as you want. You're doing a brilliant job.
sorry. <laughs> I forgot again to unmute myself. Um, that was lovely. Thank you, Georgia. So many good things there. Fantastic. And I really loved um, how much you did, how much contrast in the articulation you did as well. Um, and there are some really important harmonic moments where there's a real sort of, um, the, the, where he puts the break on a harmony da, da, ba, 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 on the bass, which is a really gorgeous Handelian big movement, a <laughs> big moment. And he did a brilliant job there pulling it. That's fantastic. And one day I cannot wait for us all to be together so you can have a really lovely bass line underneath. I need a bass line. <laughs> I think you would fly with that, George. It's brilliant. Thank I, you. I wanted to say to both Jessica and Georgia, as a bass line player, I think you've done amazingly to not have a bass line to spark off because actually it's not just the melody that makes these pieces so great. It's the interaction of the two parts. That's what he's so good at. And there's a lot of interaction. It's not just a very, it's not, they're never static bass lines. They're fun. They're amazing fun to play. Um, they're very very, very equal on many ones is it the recorder sonata in c major for example da, 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 that's got the most amazing bass line actually loads of them um and so to, to keep it going to keep that, that momentum without the you know the the funk basically to spark off is, is is i've really enjoyed hearing it actually it's been it's been great um i, I, I should just say lisa i don't know if you want to add anything but to all our attendees, we I know we're rapidly running out of time. I mean, we're, we're here, so that's fine. If you need to go, of course, we understand. But do do use the chat function or the Q&A um, button if you've got any specific questions that you'd like Lisette to answer, or, or me if it's anything more general Handelian. Um, so but so we'll, we'll carry on chatting for a little bit, yeah? That's fine, yes. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting thing that we are on the one hand i think we, we both felt it was really important to do handle um but it's just finding the right angle to work at things isn't it never forgetting the base and you are of all people in the world know these bass lines <laughs> i well, cannot explain to people who are listening how brilliant that it is but do you know what i've got a confession to make here lizette i know the tre the melody lines better than the bass lines to play because no. I know. <laughs> I know. i've actually done something um slightly sacrilegious in Handelian terms, although it was long enough ago and I survived. Um, Callie and I brought these out as cello sonatas. We, we have a recording, gosh, it was 2006. Different keys, so they have different characters. But so we more, I more often play these on the cello, So I, but I absolutely love hearing the insights as to how they should be on the recorder. And, and, and you know, Handel, again, he reheated his own music, so I don't feel bad that we did that. I think it just, yeah, I do sometimes feel bad when you're listening to me play one. <laughs> Side of the stage, Lizette. It seems like a funny use of the, the personnel there, but no. Do you know? I think it's so lovely to hear things playing with different um, instruments and sonorities and timbres. I think that's actually a plus. You know, you can play Bach in on the saxophone, on yeah. the, the horn, on the, everything. You, yeah. you name it, you can. And why not? Good music is good music, and exactly. I think oh, exactly. I, I love them. I love hearing them um, on the cello. Actually, it gives me great pleasure. So thank you. Well, <laughs> yeah, on your own. it's just fantastic to hear you talk about them with the passion and love you have for the, for them today. Um, I've, I've got a question actually here from um, Ben. Um, any key tips in finding where to breathe in a fast movement with no rests? I'm Absolutely. Sure the Allegro in the E minor sonata. H, 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 that's the flute sonata, isn't it? HWV379. Absolutely. And I, um, this is not just, that's a really good question, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, find patterns there's two ways of looking at this find patterns where they finish and end also learn to um breathe um oh, what's the word in english expressively prepare the breath so it does never come at the cost of the line being broke broken and um suddenly so use what you've got as a plus rather than a minus and work with your accompanist as well when it comes to that. There are ways of doing this. The same is true for the Bach partita in A minor or C minor for the recorder. Is what to do. That is such an important thing as a wind player to know what to do when there is no, no breath. And I think that is such a learning experience. And I've, I've found, again, the older I get, the better I'm getting at being confident at doing it. 
I hope this helps, Ben. <laughs> I wonder what Handel's intention was. I mean, he was a wind player. He, well, a basic wind player. He, mm. he studied oboe. We don't know that he ever played recorder, but he certainly studied oboe. And it was supposedly his first love as, as a musician. So he must have anticipated some of these problems. It'd be interesting to look at the oboe sonatas and see uh, if he structures in places to breathe, all those kind of things. How? Because again, an instrument like that, you need a lot of breath, a lot of control. Um, yeah. But it's, I think all it is, is also harmonic knowledge and harmonic control. That's a really important thing. Um, because one thing is to master your instrument and we spend our lives doing that but the other thing we we spend or we should or one should spend our, our lives doing is mastering harmony and and phrasing and where things go and where phrases how how music the inner works of music and how to best bring that to life and i think that also is something that changes i think yes of course you can train yourself to have a huge breath capacity but if one thinks, as vo again, I'll go back to either speaking speech or vocal line, we need breath. If you play breathlessly, it is not comfortable to listen to. We are human beings, we need breath. Breath is the most natural thing as a human. It's the most fundamental thing as a human. And without that, there is a wonderful heartbeat to it, the in and out of breath. You know, and I think music should reflect this, even when it doesn't have a breath mark um, clear or space to breathe. More so than it needs that space to breathe, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I when I was learning repertoire as a child on the cello, my teachers would always get me to sing it first rather than even try and play it and actually it refers back to something you said Lisette about the B flat sonata which has no markings in it no slurs for example when learning the Bach cello suites take everything out because actually then you see the structure and the architecture and you will know where to breathe um, and it'll be the same with these actually absolutely just something that comes with experimenting and it's not, not something you sort of wake up and know how to do absolutely exactly not <laughs> um Yes, Ben says, I think I'm trying to hide the breaths. I should probably embrace them. Yes, embrace them in a very natural way. Not sort of, <gasps> but um, there's ways of doing things that you can prepare the breath, absolutely embrace that humanity that is the breath because it's lovely to play and it's lovely to listen to as well because it becomes natural. You know, we're not machines. We're not supposed to play to the, the second on with a metronome. You know, we are supposed to, you know, have the just natural ebb and flow of phrases. Um, whatever type of music, not just in Baroque music, by the way. Um, it's fascinating to hear all these these answers. I don't know if, uh, Jessica, you have any question, any more questions or any things that you want to go back to or, or Georgia as well. Any any questions? Because um, that, that, I think we've answered for the moment those from our attendees. So. I'll open it back up to the panelists. Uh, no questions for me, but definitely lots and lots to think about and to work with. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. I'm so pleased because this is really what I've, I've wanted and we've wanted um, when we thought of these masterclasses that there is no, I don't come to this with lots of answers. I come with lots of questions and lots of different ways of thinking about things. Um, and so that is um, really important. So if, if, you know, together, Patty and I can um, pass that on. That's a brilliant thing. I'm really happy. <laughs> really. Ha and read. Go find out. Go listen. And, yeah, we'll generate. I think, yeah, we always end up with more questions than we started with. Certainly in rehearsal, actually, we come to something thinking that, you know, we, oh, Jessica's got another question. Oh, yeah. And it, well, just sort of like a logistical question. Um, I know that when I'm hosting a Zoom, it, I, it, shows me the chat afterwards it's like save chat like but as a guest or panelist i'm not sure if i'll have access to the chat and you guys had posted a couple of yep. really useful links so will we be able to save the chat or will you yeah. resend the links i can certainly do that i get a transcript of the chat at the end so i will make sure i i, I save any any links and if there's anything that i i can answer like i think it was nicola's uh 
posed, I, I perhaps um, she liked my idea of, of Handel being mean to Corelli, but maybe I need to substantiate that a bit. I mean, that's a kind of a gut feeling. Um, of course, without time travel, we can't prove it, Nicola. Um, but um, yeah, if I can, and actually, Lisette, your question about Corelli having a go at Handel for playing too much in the French style, that would bear further further looking at, yeah. definitely. That would be I really can't remember the book, and I, I, I can't remember... I know what it was. I know I, when I did it, I did a bit of filming for uh, Deutsche Welle. And back in 2009, I did like a tiny little documentary for them. Um, I, at the time, I was part of Musicians in Residence at the Handel House. I was there for years working as Musician in Residence. And I had to do a bit on, on camera about Handel's life and, and, and things. And I remember, you know, really reading up. And it was that time, but... I think it's very likely, because if you think about the Germany that Handel came from, he arrived in Italy in 1707, effectively, very end of 1706. And we think of his um, training at that point as being, he's just come from Germany. But what was the music in Germany? What was the background then? And actually, French music, uh, musicians trained in the French style, was very prevalent, uh, uh, as you know, Lisette, of course, in the yeah. German courts, as was italian styled music as well. There was a lot of sort of musical cross-pollination. So although he came from a relatively small town and hadn't gone much further than from Halle to Hamburg by the time he went to Rome, he had come into contact with lots of different musical influences, including this French style, which was so popular because of dance and because of etiquette. So I, I think there's probably a good basis for that comment. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I just wished I knew what the source was. But anyway, it's a, it's a really interesting thing, um, how all these worlds collide, isn't it? Mm. How people's different ideas and handles. I mean, you'll know this better than I, Tati. It's quite a strong character. Very definite idea. I, I, I mean, gosh, what, what, what would I give to be able to, to meet him? I, I, <clears throat> I imagine he's a strong character. Yes. I mean, all the writings we have, all the documentary evidence, and luckily there is a lot. Um, all suggests, you know, yes, definitely. Uh, actually, I've got a couple of ideas of somewhere I'll go to substantiate that comment about the French. Because yeah. um, there, there, are some, a lot of um, us Handelians like to stick together. So I shall go to a few fellow. <laughs> get the source for that that'd be great brilliant uh, oh um yes jessica you've you've raised a very important point uh handel did invest in the slave trade and profited from it i don't know i i couldn't say for sure that he invested directly but he certainly would have profited from it as did most noble men of that time sadly and it's it's an important question at the moment how we we assess and reevaluate. um um, d definitely that's the circles he moved in absolutely did invest and profit from it and I think it's fair to say that most of um, sort of western life in the, this um, was was based on that I know I'm Portuguese and I know we had huge huge I mean it's heartbreaking it's heartbreaking how many of our beautiful monuments was really built on the back of, um, you know, I, I don't even like calling them slaves. I, they are human beings. To call them slaves is already dehumanizing. And I think, um, and this is a big problem. And it, it's important to know what to do with the work of a man in a world where you knew no different. And how we, when we know different, what we do um, right now. And that perhaps it's also a really, really big um, question. It's important. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica, for that. It's absolutely right. Mm. Well, I should. Um, yes, victim. Yes, your comment. Thank you, Jessica. I don't know if we've got any more um, general questions on the music, um, but if not, um, I could direct you to have a go and find our YouTube channel. Um, it's it's got a blue plaque on it rather than um, a photo of us. There is one with a photo of us, um, all in blue, and it's called Brook Street Band Topic. But that's owned by somebody else. It doesn't really benefit us. Um, so if if you could look, go to the one with the blue plaque, you'll see loads of films, particularly uh, recitals, a lot that Lisette's put up on the flute and recorder. Um, some breathing exercises. Um, um, some some more, you know, look at comparing Baroque and modern cello, looking inside the harpsichord. We're adding to this all the time, and this has been funded for from the Arts Council of England. And it's especially at the moment where we we actually can't be together. It's it's um it's lovely seeing everyone over the computer. Lisette and I were supposed to have seen each other three days ago. We were supposed to perform in Cambridge, and because we're in the second lockdown now in the UK, that was cancelled. Send all prayers that we get to be together on the 20th of December in, in Norwich. Norwich. But meanwhile, um, 
Ah, uh, yes, Jessica, you're right. The topic, is, yeah, it's the algorithm in YouTube and it's also the Orchard Enterprises, which monetizes all the tracks. But yeah, hop over to our channel and if, if you haven't yet subscribed, do, because it doesn't it doesn't bombard you with anything at all and it just helps us in our viewing stats. And plus you get lots of nice content. Um, and I, what I'll do is send, find um, a way of sharing the, the, the links in this chat. And do keep an eye out on our website because we will be putting up more masterclasses. Um, I'm going to extend this project in, into the new year. And so there'll be many more opportunities uh, and, and to stay in touch. But for now, I just, I want to thank our, our wonderful players who are so um, brave to do that. Jessica and Georgia, thank you both. All the way from New York, Jessica. That's Thank you for having us. Thank you for uh, having me. Yeah. Great, great pleasure. And and Georgia, I think Handel would have admired the colour of your room. It's very oh. <laughs> Georgia is oh, amazing. Definitely an 18th century colour on your wall. And actually the I it especially. Has to, yeah. <laughs> has, to, has to go to you, Lizette. Thank you so much for sharing your amazing knowledge and expertise. What you will get um, in the future, hopefully, is a chance to hear Lizette give masterclasses in person once we're all unlocked. I mean, that's probably more for us in the UK, but who knows? Um, so yeah. thank you again, Lizette. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. As soon as coronavirus is over, my first plan is to make a trip to England to oh, visit all my friends. Lovely. I have so many friends there, yeah. Oh, Thank you to our audience for uh, lovely comments, actually. Um, I've just spotted one disappearing about T-shirts. <laughs> I want one. Can I have one? I love it. I don't. They don't make them anymore. It's very, very, very old. And it was thanks to Callie, our harp school player, Carolyn Gibley. Oh, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, and take care, everybody. And will there'll be a transcript? Uh, the film of this will be up on our YouTube channel very soon. So be a, a chance to take in all the information in your own time. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>